right, welcome back everybody to conversation number 60. Uh, we are here with Don Vesley, who's going to share with us his talk from Super Week um, on looking for more A-B test winners. So meet Don, uh, he, uh, boy, where do we start? Let's see. He uh, is the founder of the conference formerly known as the Conversion Hotel, uh, the owner of abtestguide.com, the Experimentation Culture Awards founder and moderator. Uh, he hosts AB Test Mastery Course on CXL Institute, and he has more than 20 years experience in online optimization. And, you know, recognized worldwide as an influential thinker, writer, public speaker on conversion optimization and AB testing. You can find him, well, everywhere. Um, but you should definitely check him out. And he's also just really an all around nice guy and great uh, person to get advice from. So I recommend you go find him wherever he is and just hit him up and ask him good questions because he's he's just a really good advisor. So I'm going to stop sharing and hand it over to you, sir, to kick us off. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. Uh, wonderful introduction. I want to meet this guy. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, uh, same, same for you, Kelly. Uh, thank you very much for uh, running this uh, test and learn community. It's always wonderful uh, to be part of this uh, present here, but also to uh, uh, join sessions and learn from others. So thank you for uh, putting in all the time and effort in uh, in keep uh, keeping this going. Uh, well, well done. Well appreciated. So uh, welcome everyone. It's uh, almost evening here in the Netherlands. I'm in Europe, um, uh, and this is going to be a presentation on looking for more A/B test winners. Um, I was not aware of this being recorded, so um, I cannot do the presentation. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, it, it, it's it's about me opening up my toolbox uh, after 20 years of conversion optimization experience um, uh, and how to find more A/B test winners. Uh, first, for the ones that don't know me, I was born in 74, which makes me um, experienced in, in digital uh, because I started creating my first website in 96 uh, and I, was, I, I fell in love with the web. Amazing to be able to build something yourself and just release it without any production facility or whatsoever and others could, could use it and, 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 and click on it. and. And then you can do log file analyzing and see what happens on your website. So when I was done with university, I, uh, uh, I, I joined my first, well, it's not really my first job. I started working in, uh, in 97, but in 1999, I joined my uh, first internet uh, startup company. I was the first employee and they were uh, building websites, uh, which uh, was uh, what I was going to do. And uh, I think in 2002, I started running my first A-B experiments. Before that, I tried to optimize the website by just looking at the data and then making some change, changes to the website and then see what happens in the data. Uh, that's not like the best solution. It's at least something. It's optimizing, but it's not really uh, properly proofing causality on a trustworthy uh, way. Uh, so in 2002, I started running my first A-B experiments. Uh, made all the mistakes you can make, especially on the statistics side of A-B testing. And in 2007, um, I left this uh, this first company uh, and started working uh, for myself as a consultant and was allowed to finally publish about uh, conversion optimization and A-B testing. Because in this internet publishing company, everything was kept as a secret. Like what, what we do is our magic sauce, so let's not share this. And finally, I was allowed to share, and this is something I can recommend to everyone. If, if you have knowledge, share it with everyone because you will get 10 times more knowledge in return uh, once you start sharing. Uh, in 2009, I founded Online Dialogue, which is a, a still existing conversion optimization agency in the Netherlands, focusing on uh, combining data science and, and consumer psychology to optimize conversions on websites. Uh, and I uh, started speaking internationally in 2012 uh, because uh, our agency back then won, I think like nine or 10 wish test one awards, which was something big back in the old days, um, uh, which is also where I got to know Kelly uh, from the days she was working at Dell, also participating in this uh, competition. Um, it was fun, uh, but it was only awarding a specific AB test outcome. So I'm pretty confident that one of the awards uh, we won with the NC was a false positive. Must be. If you win nine awards, one of them must have been a false positive. But hey, uh, early days. 
Um, uh, I started running my own conferences, Kelly mentioned Conversion Hotel in 2014. And then I moved on uh, in the Experimentation Culture Awards. Because for me, conversion optimization is fun. Um, but to really embed this in a company, you, you really have to work on this experimentation culture. And setting up the culture and the structure and the process is so much more important than just running a couple of experiments. And this is what I'm still doing. I'm, I'm consulting companies uh, on the experimentation programs, uh, how to make it faster, smoother, better, more trustworthy. Uh, and, and so on. But today I'm opening up a toolbox and we're going to look for more A-B test winners. Uh, because I strongly believe that organizations that adopt an experimentation approach for the digital products will be winning in the future. And of course, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. This is something you probably all believe. Uh, and to have it more boldly, you can also say organizations that don't adopt an experimentation approach for the digital products will not be winning in the future. And before we dive in, let me do a shameless plug for the Experimentation Culture Awards. Um, this is about awarding your growth and experimentation culture. This is not about the current level of your experimentation maturity. It's about the steps you have taken in the past 12 months. So maybe you went from nothing to your first experiments. Maybe you ramped up from a couple of experiments to more experiments. Maybe you even are embedding this in a broader way in your organization. Broadcast is June 15 global broadcast um, and the case deadline, submit your cases on the growth of experimentation culture is April 25th. So please submit your stories and share it with the community. We can all learn from this. Well, A-B test velocity is growing, which is uh, good to see. Uh, we're running more experiments. And I did a recent study together with VWO um, uh, on a one-third US audience, two-third European audience. Um, this audience is a bit biased because they're kind of mature, because they're following the experimentation culture was they're following Conversion Hotel, A-B test guide. And they grew 48% in the number of experiments they conducted in the previous 12 months. So they're now at 74 on average, and they grew from something like 38. And then we have underperformers and outperformers, but the underperformers still run 56 experiments. Uh, and be aware, this is a more mature audience. And outperformers run 127 experiments. Uh, this is without outliers. There are some companies out there that run 10,000 experiments per year, and they got left out on this specific average. Uh, but it's growing, and it's growing fast, because if we're growing another 50%, we're going to be above 100, and it will continue to grow and continue to grow. Um, the fun thing is, on the other hand, if you look at the number of digital changes in organizations, changes to digital activities backed up by A-B test results, it's the bottom bar, only 25% on average is being backed up. So he's, you see the room for growth. The outperformance, 42%, underperformance, 12%. So we, we can run four times more experiments. So the number of experiments will go up to 400, 500 experiments per year on average in organizations in somewhere some point in the future if we back everything up by A-B test results. So velocity will even grow faster. But yeah, this is all amazing. Number of experiments going up. In the meantime, you see the winning percentage going down. So the number of uh, significant positive outcomes of A-B experiments is declining. This percentage is going down. And of course, this is not a real issue because if, if, if you speed up the number of experiments more than your winner percentage is going down, you still are finding more true positives and more results. So you're growing faster, making better decisions and, and, and speeding up this velocity is still making your company grow. But if you know anything about statistics, if your winner percentage goes down too much, you probably will have a really high false discovery rate, which means that the number of absolute true positives is going down. So while you're growing the number of experiments, your winning percentage is declining, your number of real true positives is going down. And that's an issue. And of course, it, 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 it makes sense. If you grow experimentation, first it was one dedicated team focusing on, on optimizing conversion so that they were really good in this. But once you start helping other departments, other teams with experimentation, they're not as good as the specific one dedicated team. So they will have a lower percentage, but also speeding up velocity 
uh, is, is, is also not really helping because it's focusing so much on philosophy is it becomes like let's test anything let's let's test any discussion out there oh uh, what text should we put on the call to action we don't know let's test it uh, and maybe this is not the best thing to do but to me ids and prioritization for testing needs to improve a lot because in the end what we are doing here validation experimentation is not a solution to avoid risk validation is your invitation to take more risk if for some c level or or like senior managers experimentation um sounds like risk at first we're going to validate everything but this, this is not something i want my team to do because if they start validating everything the, the, they start tweaking the, 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 the really small things. And I want, to, I want them to take more risk. So this is your invitation to take more risk because you can validate what you're doing before you launch something to your users. Um, so uh, validation is not a solution to try everything. Validation is to verify your customer journey insights. So this is all about optimizing the customer journey. And this is what I'm going to be sharing. I'm going to be sharing my approach after those 20 plus years of optimization. If I enter a new client, what is my approach to start optimizing their conversion rates? It's three steps. The first step is I want to understand the full customer journey. The second step is that I want to know where it must be optimized. And then of course, the first step, the first step is create promising changes. So I want to understand the customer journey. I want to know where it must be optimized, and then I want to create promising changes. So this is all about ideation and prioritization. Let's dive in the first one. Understand the full customer journey. What do I do, I do when I find a new client? Well, I have this specific example. This is a new client. They're from the Netherlands. They're a ticket marketplace. They have the bus on the front cover because he's performing in the Netherlands in May 2023, big stadium. And the first thing I'm going to do is, of course, to buy and use the products. It's fun to go to Bruce. Uh, but of course, I want to understand the full customer journey. I want to buy this product. I want to see the emails, the follow-up emails. I want to understand what they are selling. So I'm going to buy and use the products of the company I'm starting with. And while I'm doing that, I also start talking, of course, to the company and to the customers. And when talking to the company, I want to really understand what their business model is. How are they making money? And what products do they have? How are they growing? And what's really important for them? What are their targets? And what are their key performance indicators? Um, I once made this mistake. Like I said, I've made all the mistakes you can make in, in optimization. Um, we had this client, MoneyU, which is a financial uh, uh, company. So they do mortgages, uh, saving accounts, and so on. And uh, the, the first thing we did when we got hired is just dive into data and see where the opportunities are. And we quickly learned that they were selling a lot of savings accounts, uh, but there was a lot of drop off in the sales funnel of savings accounts. Uh, high potential, uh, a lot of users, a lot of conversions, really interesting to start optimizing and run experiments on, which is what we did. So after the first three months, we did our first presentation to the higher management of this organization about our results. And, and we hit some, some good winners. So we were able to tell them that we raised conversions with 20% on the savings product. And then the reply of this, this senior management was, oh, that's fascinating. Uh, well done. But um, we already reached our target for savings products for the first two months of this year. Um, we need to, to sell more mortgages, more loans, and savings is not our, our, our priority. We even probably need to de-optimize uh, the number of saving products we're selling. So we made the mistake not talking to the business and the right people up front, because even our, the team we were working with was not aware of the fact that this was not a KPI. They just also saw the big opportunity. They were really happy, but they were focusing on the wrong product. So, so please uh, do this talk to understand what needs to be optimized. And of course, I also ask them about their competitors. Who are your competitors? Uh, and they will, they, they, they will know. They, they will tell you their competitors. And you want to learn about the competitors because they are also part of the customer journey of their clients. And then, of course, I start talking to the customers. Uh, I, I, I want to do interviews. I want to understand the reasons to buy this product. Uh, and I want to certainly understand the reasons not to buy this product. And I'm asking not for competitors, but I'm asking for alternatives. 
because it's, you're buying a product or a service to solve a specific problem, but maybe that problem can be solved in a different way than just buying this specific product. Maybe there's some other solution. I want to know this, all these other solutions. So with these conversations, and of course, you know, when talking to customers, um, the interviews are really important, but also please go to the call center. There must be some call center taking phone calls or doing live chats with customers, and you, you can just listen in. They probably have a tool where they store all the chat conversations and all the email conversations with customers. Read through because this, this is the customer talking. And yes, do interviews, but also do this to really understand how the customer is communicating and what their problems are. So while doing this, uh, you get an understanding on the business, on the products, the business model, the targets, the reasons why clients are buying, why they're not buying, and you have a full list of competitors and alternatives. And of course, if you if if you if your list is not long enough, go to Google, type in the product name, type in the brand name, and it will pop up all sorts of competitors also that are advertising on that specific keyword, which is also important. So, and and then of course, what you do once you have this list of competitors and alternatives. The first thing I'm doing is I'm going to buy and use their products. Because in the end, the, the customer journey, especially on, on digital, is the, 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 these users will go to, to websites of these alternatives and competitors and, of course, of the, of the company you're helping or you're working at. And, and, and they will look at all these offers and at some point make a decision. So I want to understand also the products and the alternatives and buy them and use them. And then the fun starts, because once I know the competitors and alternatives, um, I'm going to use a tool like Visual Ping. I'm, I'm not affiliated to, to this specific tool, and there are several solutions out there, which are shown on the next slide, but I just like this specific solution. Um, if there's a better one, please let me know. Um, but what I do, I will um, stop monitoring the websites of the alternatives and the competitors. Um, so I type in, in this case, this is the AC website for, from Online Dialog. Um, so I'm currently monitoring the website of Online Dialog. If they make changes to the homepage, which is not my task, but the content marketeer's task, I will get an email with the specific change. And I will get the visual screenshots, screenshots from the old variation and screenshots from the updated variation in my mailbox. So once you start configuring this, for all the competitors and all the alternatives, you will get an email once they're changing something, which is really fascinating. It, it, for me as a consultant, it's always fun to send an email to my client telling, oh, I saw that your competitor made a change to the website. They changed pricing. They have this uh, Easter campaign or whatsoever. Uh, please be aware because this also uh, is important to understand for your customer journey because your customer journey is changing because the competitor is changing something. But this is visual ping and it, it's affordable. It, it will send you screenshots and it becomes more interesting once you start monitoring. These are other tools you can use. Once you start monitoring, also what your A-B testing. If they're using tools like Optimizely or VWO, this is the Optimizely homepage. This is the Chrome plugin from conversion.com, which is another agency based in the UK. I think also now in the US. Um, and they created this tool that just reads the Optimizely library and will tell you uh, on what specific pages experiments are running and what the variations are. You can click through the variations. Um, and of course, uh, with a tool like Build Wit, you can scan your competitors for uh, what kind of experimentation tools they're using. And with a tool like this, you can see what variations they're testing. And then if they implement a test variation, you will get a ping by visual ping telling you that they implemented a specific test variation. So now you're also understanding and learning about the competition and hopefully they do trustworthy experimentation. Um, but probably on, on, on the speeds and, and team size and, and a typical tool they're using, you can tell if it's trustworthy probably or not. Uh, but you will get emails uh, on changes they're making on potentially winning experiments. So competitive intelligence is really important and it's all out there. You have plugins for VWO, you have plugins for optimize the all tools. Uh, 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 can be spied upon. To give an example, um, I was working for a, a Dutch hotel organization. They have like 75 hotels in the Netherlands. And their biggest competitor is uh, Booking.com. Um, uh, because uh, these hotels are uh, always quite booked, so 
built with guests. Um, but if you book through booking.com, it's going to cost them like 15 to 20% fees. If you book directly on, on the hotel website, they're making more money. So the game is not getting more conversions. The game is to, to, to persuade people to book directly at the hotel website and not at booking.com. So uh, we were monitoring booking.com as being the biggest competitor. And at some point, uh, we found out they were promoting Ideal, which is a Dutch payment solution uh, specific for the Netherlands. You can pay directly. And when they started promoting Ideal, the conversion rate on the hotel websites went down. So suddenly more people were starting to book through booking.com and not directly to the hotel website. So of course, we started an experiment also promoting Ideal more on the hotel website. But that was not really fully helping. It was helping a bit. And then at some point, luckily, booking stopped using Ideal. Uh, probably they like credit card more because if you have your credit card on file, it's, it's an easier buy and so on. And they didn't want to promote a single one solution. You can still use it, but they're not promoting it anymore on the website. And then conversions went up. So we started to run more experiments on this to really emphasize the fact you can use this homegrown Dutch payment solution on this Dutch hotel website and that raise conversions. So there was also, uh, by learning on, on spying on the competitor, what they were doing and using that input to optimize our own. So we're doing this, you have a like a core understanding, uh, the basics of the product, the business, the customer, and the alternatives. And this is where I start enriching this content because once I know something about product, business, customer, and alternatives, I will start using scientific research. There are a lot of search engines out there. Google Schooler is a good example, but also Semantic Schooler, which is a free solution from a couple of universities. Deep Dive, which is like the Spotify for scientific articles. And if you have the money or a student at your organization, you can use Science Direct, that's more expensive. Um, amazing resources on scientific papers written about anything. The amount of money being spent on scientific papers this year is tremendous. And it has amazing knowledge. And of course, this is just an example from Google Schooler. You need to understand which papers are important. So number of citations, uh, which is kind of low on the papers I'm pointing out here, is important yeah, because not every scientific paper uh, is, is continued to be true. Uh, especially if you're, these are older papers uh, and not really cited papers. Uh, but I was looking for reasons why people buy a bet online. Why do you want to buy a bet online? I was helping an e-commerce store selling bets online, which is a product that's expensive. You want to buy this for at least 10 years. So uh, you probably want to go to the store to try this out, uh, but they're trying to sell this online. And then you will bump into all sorts of articles, and especially the number four, the, the second arrow, is uh, if you are purchasing the better line, one of the reasons uh, why they are doing this, uh, why are they buying this kind of articles online? There's a whole scientific paper written about this. That's kind of fascinating. So I'm going to read these kind of papers just to add more knowledge about products, customer journey, alternatives, and competitors. I want to understand the full customer journey. And I think the most important lesson is experience the customer journey and monitor changes to the customer journey, not only on your own website, but also at the competitor in the alternative. So let's dive into the second part. Now we have this basic understanding. I want to know where it must be optimized. And we're talking digital here. So we're talking analytics. Of course, you can also optimize logistics and so on. And the focus here is digital. And with analytics, um, I have a different setup um, uh, on, on, on using that data than uh, what's usually set up out of the box. Um, and probably you're now making changes to your GA installation, moving to GA4. So maybe it's the right time to set up something like this. This is a typical e-commerce flow example. First, I want to measure all users on the website, the app or whatsoever, with enough time to take action. Uh, if they're only on the website for one, two, three seconds for some reason, I will not be able to influence these users. Uh, maybe these are bots, could be. Uh, maybe you have a website where the first action is to log in, but people hardly interact with, with that website besides logging in. Uh, I want to understand, do, is there enough time to take action? Then I want to know the number of users that had at least some interaction, some scrolling maybe, uh, maybe clicking on a specific element. Uh, at least they're interacting with the website. They, they show some interest in, in what the website is telling them. 
Then I'm going to create a bucket with the users on this website with heavy interaction. And of course, the definition heavy interaction, that's kind of hard and something you alter along the way. Because maybe this is like at least I've seen three page views, at, at least has seen five content elements, at least has a, a specific step in the in, in the journey. Uh, but this is this segment is something you tweak along the way. And I'll show you an example how to do this and learn about this, how you can create those segments. Then I want to have the users with clear intent to buy. So at least I have looked at the specific product, uh, has had interaction with a specific product. And then, of course, I want to have users that are willing to buy. So that takes a step from baskets to the first steps in the checkout. Then, of course, we have the users succeeding in buying transactions. And then, of course, users who return with intent to buy more. And what I'm doing in Analytics Setup is I'm going to create a funnel report on users per segment, the dropout rate from each segment to the next segment, and the time it takes on average to go to the next segment. And to give you an example, this is uh, Safari Bookings website. They offer uh, safaris. The website is kind of obvious. And, um, but then they're not selling directly. They are a lead generator. So they will get you in contact with local guides that uh, can help you uh, have a tailor-made safari experience. And what we did for this website, we looked, OK, we want to have total users. We want to have users with interaction. We want to have users with interest. And interest is once they have seen at least one operator page, one tour page. Users with intent, that are users that opened the specific lead form, successful users, submitted a form, and loyal users that have multiple submitted forms. We created the segments, cut the data from the API. And of course, uh, the, this, is like, this is the in-between step. How to know if this is the right setup, uh, we just ask questions to users. So we run surveys. Apologies, the survey is in, is in Dutch. Uh, this is a whole different website where the survey is run. This is a hotel website again. But we are just asking the user, are you currently comparing prices on other websites? Yes or no? Uh, we also ask the question, uh, have you visited this website also with another device, like, like desktop, tablet, smartphone, but just to understand the device pollution? And do you already specifically know your date, destination, or specific hotel you want to go to? So get these answers. Um, and we inject these answers in analytics. So in analytics, we now can create a segment on people that are yes comparing prices and people that are not comparing prices, and then see the different behavior in analytics. And we use this kind of info to create these specific segments that we use to create this whole funnel and dropout flow segments. Uh, to get back to this Safari website, uh, the red bars are desktop, the gray bars are mobile. So there's a small difference between desktop and mobile usage. Um, but the first step is interesting. Uh, this is uh, the, the click-through rate per step uh, from users. So total users, the users with interaction. So users with enough time to have some interaction to users with interaction. That's only like 45% on effort. So 55% of the users is not doing anything on the website. They spend some time, but they're not scrolling, they're not clicking. That's kind of fascinating. And maybe we should have a look uh, on where they're buying traffic from. Um, but if, if those channels are decent, then this interaction is kind of low. So that could be an issue. Then from interaction to real interest, so visiting a tour operator page, that's uh, a little bit above 50%. That sounds okay-ish. But then from interest to intent to buying intent, that's only like 10%. So they will go to the tour page, but from tour page to start opening the lead form, that's a really big dropout. From intent to success, that's good, 50%. So once they're on the lead generation page, 50% becomes a lead, that's strong. But then from success to loyal, so submitting multiple requests, that's only again 10%. But based on creating these segments, we now know, okay, we have three areas where to look at. Like once they start the journey, something could be wrong. Once they're on the tour operator page, they're not really motivated, persuaded to go to the lead form. And once they submitted a lead form, they were successful. It must be quite easy to convince them to submit another lead to a different tour operator because this company is getting paid per lead. Um, so this is what we use to understand where do we need to optimize. And so with using analytics, I'm more looking at users per segment and the conversion and time it takes to move from segment to segment. 
And then what are the essential pages, pages where decisions are made? So well, once we know people are not moving from to operator page to lead form page, that to operator page is the important page. Here, the decision is made not to move on. But this is a specific location. We want to dive in deeper to understand what's going on. And once I dive in deeper, the first thing I'm going to do is what I've called conversion mapping. I'm just going to leave out elements on the specific page, let's say the two operator page, and see what happens. And I do this uh, in, a, in a banditized way. So I'm just running multiple A-B experiments at the same time where I leave out elements. So let's leave out all the images from the two operator or the image cover cell. Uh, let's leave out all the USPs. Let, let's leave out the description. Uh, let's leave out the, 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 the progress bar. Let's leave out the, any motivation that's added. Let's leave everything out. Maybe not the call to action. That's kind of important, kind of obvious that it will kill conversions. And because they are run as a banditized AB experiment, if it's, it's really hurting your conversions, the traffic will quickly shift to the default state. So the element will be visible for everyone. And if it's, if it's an element that's left out, that's a, a, something positive for conversion, the traffic will quickly go to the B variation, to the variation and shown to everyone. And we run this to understand what's going on. So this is an example from the hotel website. And in this case, uh, uh, leaving out the green elements raises conversions. So we have a couple of elements on this specific website. If we leave them out, conversions are going up. That's interesting because it means that this element is distracting or the copy is really bad. I don't know. It could be that that's, it's something negative. The gray elements are the ones that are inconclusive. So if you leave them out, nothing happens. So maybe also bad copywriting or not really needed. Um, so it, it gives you a, a, a simple overview on the elements that have an effect on conversions and elements that don't have an effect. In this case, there are no red elements. Um, so there are no elements, if you leave them out, that hurt uh, uh, the, 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 the conversions. That's also kind of interesting. Uh, so it gives us an overview on the specific page which elements to focus on. Uh, I've been running so many experiments on specific elements uh, in the past uh, where we were not able to move the needle. Um, uh, but well, uh, the most easy way would have been just to leave out the element to understand if it was moving the needle at all. This is what we do with conversion mapping. There are not specific tools supporting this, but you can build this in any A-B testing solution, um, uh, especially if they support uh, banditized experiments, but you can also start shifting traffic on your own or automate it. Uh, so it takes some time, but it's really rewarding. Of course, not everyone will have the number of users to run so many experiments at the same time. Um, so what we also do for smaller websites is um, uh, just use a tool like Usability Hub. Um, and ask like 20 users, 25 users, 35 users, please click on the three most important elements on this tour operator page. Or please click on the three elements that are not really of interest to you on the specific tour operator page. And so this already gives us some direction. It involves some risk uh, because it's a different kind of task. It's not an experiment, uh, but it's value. It's, it's some sort of evidence. Less trustworthy, but still evidence. And then you can focus more on which elements to leave out when you once you run these banditized experiments, or maybe you don't have any users at all of the specific page which you want to optimize, then you really need to use this kind of solutions. And of course, you want to run this on your users. Um, so what we always do when we run a survey like this, asking, are you comparing hotel prices on this website or other websites? Once they click the button, submit the answers, uh, which are injected analytics. Uh, we also have a thank you page. And on this thank you page, we will ask these users, would you like to participate more often in research uh, for optimizing our websites, giving you a better experience? And of course, a couple of users will say yes. And this is your feedback army, which you can use within Usability Hub. So you won't have to pay for their audience. And also their audience is not really tailored to your specific products. But now you have your own feedback army, which you can use to ask these questions on which elements are important or not. So this is what I do to understand where it must be optimized. So really diving in the segments, uh, which segments are, are, are promising, uh, can be optimized. What specific page is this decision for this segment being made? Uh, what's happening on the specific page? Which elements move the needle? And once I understand this, I'm going to create promising changes. 
And with creating promising agents, I fully rely on consumer psychology. Um, I have five elements. The first one is ability. I want to increase the ease of the desired behavior. Uh, are users able to do the complete task that they should do? Um, I could also uh, run experiments on attention. Uh, maybe they're not aware of the specific element with the USPs and it should get more attention, or maybe they cannot even see the call to action button. Uh, you can also put attention over there, of course, or attention on the imagery on the tour operator page. Then I have experiments based on motivation, uh, appeal to the customer needs and goals. Uh, so of course, the first they should be able, uh, there should be ability, they should be able to, to perform a specific task. Then you could focus attention to specific motivation. Uh, so it, it works together. Certainty is a really important one. Uh, a lot of people are still uh, afraid uh, with buying online that, that something is not going like they want to. Uh, so this is something you can really emphasize to improve conversions. And finally, you have choice architecture. The way you offer the choices, the way you offer the flow of the checkout funnel, uh, going from product to a lead form, uh, that's also something you can really optimize for. So all the experiments I'm doing are in one of these five months. And then of course, I'm gonna hypothesize if we apply this specific UX change, then uh, this behavioral change will happen among this specific group, but this specific segment, which we get from data because of this specific reason. So all these experiments are tied on motivation, attention, certainty, ability, and so on. And of course, there are sub hypotheses beneath that, but these are the main five. And we're just going to try and fail and try and fail and try again. And at some point, we will succeed in optimizing conversions and getting that specific segment uh, to grow and, and, and be a larger chunk of going moving from segment to segment. And I think the most important learning is um, to build your database. Now, this is all about having a double feedback loop. It's, it's not about that one experiment that's the winner. Uh, it's about running a lot of experiments and then start doing meta-analysis, yeah, which is really strong. So uh, once you start learning that applying attention on a specific segment, or maybe even on a specific device, if you have those numbers of users, is really getting you more wins than applying certainty, then this is something that's, that's worth investing more time and money in. Uh, let's do more on attention because it's clearly getting us more wins. But this is why you need to build your database in whatever tool you're using to get a history of all your experiments uh, and to tag them on specific segment, users, uh, location, element, and of course, also uh, in our case, psychological uh, principle uh, to understand where you're winning and where you're not winning. Because if you're not finding any wins, uh, it doesn't make sense to invest time over there. It's move on and do something else. Uh, you, you need to pivot. So this is how I optimize websites understand the customer journey, understand where it must be optimized, and then create promising changes, and then just test, 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 and fail, and learn, and test, and, and keep the database to, uh, to grow to bigger winning numbers um, uh, so we can learn more. Because with a database, you're not only focusing on this first part, the first pillar of the three stages of learning, which is earning uh, more money now. Uh, this is zero. You want to have this informational phase also, which is all about customer intelligence, understanding how your users are behaving. Uh, this is first order learning. And of course, the next step is even second order learning. At some point, you will understand that maybe your users need specific new products, new services. This is innovation. You want to feed this in the company. And this is also why it makes sense to run these experiments as products and not in a separated conversion optimization department at some point once you grow experimentation in your company. Earning and learning, first order learning and second order learning. And validation is not a solution to avoid risk. Validation is your invitation to take more risk to run business experiments, uh, not to try everything, uh, but really to verify uh, your customer journey insights. This is what you're doing with A-B testing. And so please help make this happen. If we grow the number of experiments in the coming years that also this winning percentage will grow along, so the absolute number of true positives will become bigger and help you grow your organization.
Uh, this approach is based on uh, the online dialogue six feet desk research model, which I need to uh, share because it's not only me, a lot of colleagues worked on this. And you see the value versus view validated, verified, and voice, uh, which are the elements I used in, uh, in the uh, approach I explained. Um, I shared my specific approach. Uh, I know others have a different approach, but I think in the end, once you understand these six P's, uh, then you will be better in optimization and have no results. So please share your stories on your growth in structure and culture on the Experimentation Culture Watch before April 25th, and uh, maybe become nominated and part of the live show on, uh, on June 15th. And uh, being nominated really helps also to grow your experimentation in your company, uh, because organizations love awards and it gets attention. It's a door opener. It's a conversation starter. And your next year will be even more fun in growing experimentation. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, please connect me on LinkedIn. I'll be also in the Slack TLC for follow-up questions after and uh, the webinar. So if you are watching the model, if you just ask TLC, then uh, I'll be happy to answer. Also take questions now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. It's great, uh, great talk as it was at Super Week. Really appreciate it. Um, we have your uh, first, hold on, let me scroll. Okay. Uh, first question is from Matt Gershoff. Uh, thanks for the talk. When choosing between higher level approaches, i.e. attention or choice architecture, et cetera, do you suggest designing an experiment to test the relative effects of each via an MVT or factorial design? If so, do you have examples? If not, is there another way to assess relative effects? Do you just run independent tests? Yeah, it's, it, uh, we run independent tests because uh, most of our uh, customers don't have the number of users to, uh, to do a uh, full-blown multivariate experiment. Um, uh, but also based on research, uh, once we uh, know on a specific page which elements uh, are, are distracting or, or, or adding a lot of value, uh, we kind of quickly, based on experience, will know, oh, but on this page, we need to increase motivation or all oh, this page is lacking ability or this page is... So we start there uh, because it, is, it looks most promising without having data of previous experiments. And then once we start experimenting, we will start getting the learnings in. And then at some point we will know that, oh, but the win rate is really low on this specific main tactic. So it, it must be something else. So let's move on. So it's it, it's a lot of failing and, and learning, but uh, uh, along the way we're growing. Of course, in the beginning, you also have low hanging fruits, which you are optimizing. So that also helps to understand what's going on. So in the beginning, it's easier to get some wins, but it's um, uh, while you're testing more and more, it becomes harder to get more wins. Uh, and then we will have learned which specific pillars are, are most interesting to stay focused on. It's almost like Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, Jonas uh, asks, does visual ping show you the before and after screenshots of the change? Yes. Yes, and other tools also. So it's uh, uh, once I get an email, uh, I will see the, the previous state. So screenshots of the, the previous uh, one and then a screenshot of the next one. Because, uh, of course, I can tell the tool to make screenshots like every 20 minutes or uh, I usually do like uh, once a day. Uh, so it creates a screenshot once a day, but only sends the email once something is updated. And uh, some of these tools are, are also fun because they only, not only do visual changes, you can also do code changes, uh, which are also interesting uh, to understand if uh, a specific competitor is adding uh, some tools, for instance. Nice. That is nice. Um, I have a question for you. I meant to ask you this at Super Week because my eyebrows raised when you said your first step is to make a purchase, <laughs> to buy the product. What happens when uh, that's not possible? Like uh, I'm helping uh, whatever car brands um, to uh, to sell more cars. Yeah. 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 We have a client who sells homes. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I would love to. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably will ask the client uh, kindly. Would you please uh, pay? It is for me, but no. The, um, uh, uh, it's not not something that happens that often. Uh, of course, uh, 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 if you want to have a mortgage uh, or indeed uh, want to no, buy a car. Not, we have clients that sell prescription drugs, right? You can't just go buy 
right? I, so. I, I, yeah, yeah. But the, the, then I, I probably will be able to still buy it and just take something. So I, at least I, I want to go through the full journey. I want to understand what's going on. Yeah. Uh, but if that's not really possible, then I, I, I want to spend more time with uh, with actual clients that uh, that bought the product and understand their journey and what they have uh, they have gone through. Gotcha. Any other questions, folks? Going once, going twice. Hey, Ton, real quick, a question about volume for you. That's Nick. You kind of introduce yep. yourself, man. Hey, I'm Nick. It's awesome to talk to you. Um, real quick, so at the beginning of the presentation, you showed us the underperformers, outperformers, and the amount of experiments per year. Do you have any like general guidelines on how you back up into how many experiments a client should be running per year? Oh, that's uh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, I, I once created a spreadsheet a long time ago, uh, which calculates the minimal detectable effects on each specific template of a website. So with e-commerce, you have the home page, landing pages, index page, product page, funnel, and so on. So you have like seven, eight templates. Uh, uh, and of course, if it's a, a large client, you can segment this on mob mobile and, and desktop or specific users coming from AdWords or whatsoever. Uh, but basically, seven templates. And then uh, let's get the number of users per week, number of transactions per week going through the specific page, and then calculate if we want an experiment on like max four weeks, what the minimal detectable effect is. Uh, and if it's above a certain percentage, uh, let's say if it's above 10%, then it's going to be really hard to identify winners. Uh, only really uh, probably large changes or really good changes, but that happens doesn't happen that often. Uh, most of your changes are having smaller impact. Um, so based on this minimal technical effect calculation, you could calculate the number of experiments you could run per template, if you could run any experiments at all, but per template per year. Well, this is this is then based on okay once uh, this experiment stops on a specific template we're going to start in another experiment immediately so this is like your max velocity but along the way um i became more a fan of uh, if if you run into this max limit of number of experiments let's say you only have two templates where you can run experiments on um, and um, and they need four weeks then you can only run like 26 experiments per year if you want to have non-overlapping experiments on the same page. But I became more a fan of running overlapping experiments. So if you have one specific page with a lot of traffic, uh, I'm a big fan of, of running an experiment on whatever the call to action area and an experiment on the image area and an experiment on the footer area whatsoever. Of course, there will be some interference. Um, uh, it could be, but along the way, I learned that these interaction effects will they do cause to go your winning percentage to go down a little bit, uh, but the fact that you can run so many more experiments will make you find a, a higher number of absolute winners. And that's the thing you want to do. You want to have more good decision making and implement more winners. So uh, is there a limit to the number of experiments you can run on the website? Uh, well, no. Uh, but at some point, if you run like four or five experiments at the same time on a specific template, um and not mutual exclusive uh, it, you could run in some functional issues like oh but if we run this code then th this experiment b variation is not working and then you want to have this interaction defecting uh, detect uh, detecting going on uh more on a functional level um uh, but, but i haven't bumped into clients with this issue so um for me there's not a real limit uh unless you're below a certain amount of users where experimenting becomes too tough and, and not feasible from a statistical perspective, then, then the answer is zero. Awesome. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Ton. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, the chat was fascinating. Um, so thank you. I think my question is around, so oftentimes I find that you know, there are certain sections of the business that are gung-ho for experimentation. They're like, yes, let's do this. And that's uh, oftentimes your product owners, business. They're like, we, we, we're we going to make these decisions. It's going to be great. And then sometimes um, I'll see pushback from maybe dev or some other areas. So how do you 
create and encourage that culture of experimentation there? What are some of the techniques? Tone, will you give her the wonderful answer you gave me that about um, Trojan horses, please? <laughs> I was sort of thinking about it. Um, um, the, what I've learned along the way, because the, 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 the past three, four years, I'm more focusing on, on embedding experimentation culture within organizations. And um, um, embedding a culture is hard, I've learned. Um, I've learned a lot about change management. Um, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. Um, embedding experimentation structure, that's more easy. And uh, I, I've learned with doing this that uh, I always thought that buy-in from C-level um, uh, was the most important step in doing this. So get the budgets and the upload from C-level to start doing this. Um, but at some point, also management and C-level people will move out and go to a different uh, employer. Um, uh, and with them, it could even be that the whole experimentation uh, uh, funding uh, moves out of the company, sadly. Uh, I've seen that happen before. Uh, my Trojan horse is to look at uh, engineering development IT. Um, um, so far, I have not met a single CTO who is not a big fan of testing because their responsibility in the end is, of course, performance, uh, security, uh, and so on. So they are used to testing. If they release something on the website, uh, some piece of code, they will test this for bugs, for, for security, for, for performance. And the only thing they need to add is to test the impact on user experience, um, test the impact on transactions or, or leads being generated. And uh, th that's, that's a simple extra test. And they, uh, of course, their KPIs are not uh, optimizing customer experience, optimizing sales or whatsoever, but they are part of the same company. So they talk to the same people and for them, it, it's easy to, to embed this extra experiment. So once every part of code that's gonna be released through engineering is gonna be validated also with an AB experiment on customer experience or transactions, well, that's amazing because then it doesn't matter whatever is being shipped by some product team or some marketing team, it will be validated in the end and they will get the results and it will be rolled back if it's not if it's hurting a uh, user experience and it will be continued if it's if it's uplifting or or maybe it, they will keep it live if it's inconclusive non-inferiority testing um but once you have find this person and maybe it's not a cto but maybe some senior developer that's a big fan of this once they have implemented this in their engineering pipeline it will never go out it it, it doesn't matter who's going to leave the company it's it's the way they're releasing uh, the website and it's it's it, there will not be a single soul in the organization telling them oh um, uh, this whole testing process we have we should kill it and uh, uh, take it out from engineering that never happens so so your trojan horse is, is to find uh, the ones at engineering it dev that are enthusiastic about this um uh, and and to slowly embed this in your organization because we're also changing more to server side feature flagging Instead of client side testing, I'm not saying you should not do client side testing. I think you should do and client side testing and server side testing because for marketing, it kind of makes sense to do client side testing on landing pages. Uh, but while we're moving there, it, it also it already becomes more part of the discussion for engineering. So that, that's your your Trojan horse uh, to me. And then there will be product teams not a fan of this. There will be marketing teams not a fan of this. But that doesn't matter. Uh, everything they do is going to be validated. But the key is to speak their language and the devs that you're finding that are pushing back are pushing back because they think it's extra work, but they're already doing testing. It's just a different kind of testing. So what what Tone is saying is like they're, they're already doing it. We're just going to add a different layer. You're talking to them about something they're seeing is extra work. Now you got to get somebody who knows how to speak their language, speak their language and saying, oh, no, 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 I'm talking about what you're already doing. We're just going to also do this little customer testing component to make sure that we're not hurting the customer business. And you got it. And then you got your Trojan horse. You change the yeah, and, I, and I fully understand that, that they're pushing back because especially with clients are testing, it doesn't make sense for them to suddenly write some front end code. That's going to be manipulating the DOM on the, the browser of the, right. the user. It makes no sense from a development perspective. It's also stupid work to do as a developer. You, you want to work on, on bigger stuff, not writing some front end codes. 
Um, uh, but so uh, while moving to server side, uh, well, once the code is already already being written and released, uh, they will be a big fan because then they will fully understand and adopt the process. Thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tone. And a reminder for everybody, two weeks from now, Dr. Ellie Fight will be here talking about, uh, we all know about, you know, uh, fixed horizon. We all know about sequential. She's going to tell us about a third method, test and roll. So see you in two weeks. Thanks again, Tone. Really appreciate Bye -bye. it. Thank you. And everybody, one last pitch, get your uh, case submissions in by April 25th. Can't wait to read all about your experimentation culture. Bye, all.